I'm Michael Matthews. While driving through the mountains of Colorado about a year ago, my mind wandered back to my childhood, and I thought about Alabama. My dad was a lifer in the Army, which explains why I was raised in Phoenix City, a relatively small town in eastern Alabama. Phoenix City, you see, is right across the river from Fort Benning, Georgia, the largest infantry army base in the world. That made access to Phoenix City very easy, and in the 40s and early 50s, Phoenix City was known as Sin City for the entertainment it provided for the troops. With a weekend pass in hand, they would venture across the bridge over the mighty Chattahoochee River and indulge in gambling, women, and moonshine, all illegal at the time. After the Attorney General was murdered, the National Guard was brought in to keep order and all the slot machines were piled up and destroyed. Phoenix City went back to being a normal town in the South by the time I came along. I remember walking across a train trestle that crossed the Chattahoochee to save 20 minutes of walking time when my friends and I would go over to Columbus to movies or shopping. As we walked across, we could see the raging river below, always looking down to make sure each footstep landed on a railroad tie. Back then, it seemed to take forever to get all the way across. The train wasn't visible until the last minute as it turned to go west across the river. That experience certainly taught me courage. Idlehour Park was an amusement park with Ferris wheels, a swimming pool, roller coasters, bowling, and huge swings in the park that seemed to hang below 100 feet of chain and would send you 30 feet off the ground in both directions. I remember my pet German Shepherd named Queenie she was my best friend, and I would ride her around everywhere, clinging to her back. I remember my first bike, a Swen Stingray, with butterfly handlebars and a racing slick for the back tire. I rode it everywhere. One of the things I remember most was a traditional bike ride covering five miles each way, from my house to Chicken Comer's Barbecue off 14th Street. My dad would send me on my bike to get five plates on Saturdays because he didn't want to fight the traffic and have to look for a parking spot. There was always a line, but it was interesting to see all the different types of people standing, waiting for barbecue in the sunshine on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Don't ride too fast and be sure to miss all the bumps, otherwise you'll spill the sauce. Be careful, he would say. There were always kids gathered around the barbecue pit out back and an older black man sitting there, minding the meat as it cooked over the hot white coals down below. I never lingered too long. I would get the plates, secure them in the basket on the front of my bike, and then ride slowly home, like I was carrying five dozen eggs. The meat was tender, the sauce was spicy hot, the bread was so soft, and I always had a big glass of homemade sweet tea ready before I would start tearing into the barbecue, because it would sizzle through and through as you ate it all down. It was a weekly tradition for our family. As I became a teenager and could drive, I ate there more and more. It was a magical place. It was always good to go off-peak to miss all the crowds. Then you could talk to the friendly, smiling people that worked there. After high school, I moved away, but every trip back to see my mom and dad would have to begin with a trip to Chicken Comer's. We caught up on things while we ate Comer's barbecue. We would say it has a power all its own. When I moved to Colorado and my parents came to visit, I would call with a strong warning, don't forget the barbecue. My three kids loved it too, and it became more of a delicacy to eat it just three or four times a year. My dad came to visit alone once, and I waited for him to get off the plane until I realized no more people were exiting. Two or three minutes went by, and I started to worry. I knew he was on the plane. Finally, he walked slowly up the ramp. I asked him if he was all right, and he could only say, I forgot the barbecue. I am so sorry, son. He had been sitting on the plane, afraid to get off and meet me, without the traditional barbecue carry-on bag draped over his shoulder. That was the first and last time he ever forgot the barbecue. Get the idea how important Chicken Comer's barbecue was to me? Type bag you should use because it'll hold just about enough. After making films for years, I've decided that the Chicken Comer's barbecue story needs to be told. So I decided to place an ad in the local newspapers around Phoenix City, asking people to come forward and tell me the story of Chicken Comer. In the process of doing research, I met a news reporter for the Columbus Ledger named Brad Barnes. He interviewed me over the phone from my home in Colorado and wrote a great article describing my film project 
and asking for people who know the story to come forward. For documentary filmmaker and Phoenix City native Michael Matthews, the story of Anderson Chicken Comer's restaurant is exceptional. I really like to tell stories, and this is just one story that I think uh, hasn't really been told. The story is the legend of Chicken Comer that dates back to 1929. He was a man known for a blend of mustard, vinegar, cayenne pepper, and salt. It was something about it. It was, I mean, it's, it's good barbecue, and the sauce is really unique. You, you don't really find it anywhere else around the country. Matthews remembers as a child going to Chicken Comer's to pick up barbecue. There wasn't a menu, just meat, a piece of bread, and chicken signature sauce. As I talk to all these people, there's just something magical about it that I, I always, it's really in, an interesting phenomenon, not just the barbecue. I mean, it's just food, right? But it's, uh, there's something about it. I'm still trying to discover that as I as I talk to more and more people. Perhaps chicken was ahead of his time in the segregated south of the 1930s. All people, white or black, agreed. Chicken Comer's barbecue was the best. Chicken Comer was very successful, especially as a black man back in, in those times. Today, Matthews makes his home in Colorado, but he's back in the valley talking to people who remember Chicken Comer. Most of the information about how it really was is in people's heads. And so I just have to somehow, you know, get these people to come forward and, and talk to me. It's the story of an extraordinary man and a unique twist on a southern tradition. In Columbus, Chris Weigert, News 3, on your side. I've made three trips to Alabama and talked to over 60 people in person or on the phone. It has been an incredible journey based on everything I now know. Here is the story of Chicken Comer's Barbecue. His name was Anderson Comer, Sr. His name alone is cause for discussion. And I can't sit here and prove it and say that was his name, because all we used to call him was Mr. Chicken. His son was named Anderson. I never did know his real name. I always oh, really? called him Mr. Cole. To my knowledge, he cooked very little chicken, even though that's how he got his name, because right. he used to raise chickens and cook them. But once he started his restaurant, he went strictly pork. His grandparents were slaves to the Comer family and lived on Rose Hill in Columbus. And that's how he came about the name Pope his name because his grandfather adopted the Comer name, so did his father, and Chick adopted the Comer name. But who was Chicken Comer, really? He was just a good, good man, and he had probably some of the best barbecue that you've ever put your mouth on. He was a very quiet man, but he was a very stern man, too, you know. He never bothered nobody. I say he just, he just, just did his barbecue. I remember Chick was a very pleasant man, he was. He always had a smile on him. I know he was left-handed. He was a good barbecue man. Oh, I, I can say he was a great man. He was good to everybody, black or white. And if he could help you, he would. And he didn't let anybody go hungry. If he know you're hungry, you got something to eat, if he had something. And he was well-respected, and he was, he was kind to everybody. I remember Chicken Comer in particular because he was such a kind, sweet man. His spirit was so good. His reputation is that he raised a lot of children that weren't his in Phoenix City, Alabama. And he was as good to them as he was his own children. You know how to treat people and talk to people when they come in. Raymond, I ain't never been to him ask for nothing. He didn't give it to us. He, he, he was a likable person. The first time you met him, you know, he knew you and you knew him from then on, you know, he was just that type of fun. I used to play around out there by the pit where he was barbecued. And you know how smoke seems to follow you? Right. And I never got this because Papa told me this. Yeah, I said something like, Papa, the smoke keeps following me. He said, smoke follows ugly people. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I never forgot that. Remember him as being a tall, real thin guy but just always as polite as anybody on the face of this earth. And I can see him today coming in that back door at the pawn shop. He was just such a sweet man. I always had a smile on his face. Chicken and Felix Edmonds were the big dogs. Everybody listened to Felix and they listened to Chicken. Mm -hmm. Very likable guy, very down to earth. Uh, worked hard, struggled to make a living, put all his kids through school. Uh, he was a, a mild-minded black fella, and uh, he knew how to meet the public and he knew how to barbecue. He had his own method on his uh, hot sauce. He was a well thought of man. He was a good businessman. He was smart. But he was from the old breed, just like I am. <laughs> if you do something, do it right or don't do it. He appeared to be the kind that he'd help you if he could. Just like the other day, a fellow approached me, he was hungry. I said, I'll buy you breakfast. 
but I won't give you any money. But everybody thought well of him. He was just an alma man and quiet. He's very quiet. And he didn't get in politics. Mm. And as far as I remember, there was no trouble there at all at any time. No. He was an humble black man, really. He but a... now, he wouldn't let you give him no junk. You know, he'd stand on his feet, he'd be nice to you and courteous and humble, but you didn't push him. That's how everybody ought to be. Well, he was a quiet black man who cooked some of the best pork barbecue with a mustard-based sauce that anyone ever has. And he did it for the better part of 40 years. He had his own special way of cooking the meat and preparing the sauce. He took his special techniques to the grave with him. In 1929, Chicken Comer, who lived in a house on 14th Place, started selling barbecue from his backyard. When he first started, he was working for, for that Red Rose Provision Company. I believe it was out on Casino Road. And uh, on Friday nights, when he get off from that provision company, he would come home and uh, he would come and he had out in the backyard, they had a big house out in the backyard, he had a hole in the yard, put some bricks around him and put a piece of wire on the top and that's how he barbecued stuff. He barbecue. started there and a lot of people was coming, there'd be so many people in the backyard for that barbecue, I think it's for the sauce because the sauce made it so good, you know. For a while before that, he would get together with a friend, Grandpa Griggs at his place on Seal Road and slaughter and barbecue pork on Friday nights. That's probably where he got some ideas on how he wanted to make his own version of the barbecue and sauce for the day when he would sell his own. My granddaddy, Wilson Griggs, her granddaddy's brother. Uh -huh. My granddaddy's the one that, would, he was in the cattle business and he would sell and buy cattle and all. And uh, him and Chicken Coma started out together in the business. Well, to start with, he and my granddaddy barbecued in back of our house, which was off of Old Seal Road. And he would buy the hogs and all, you know, and they'd butcher them there together. We had what we called hog killing day back then. They would start selling it out of the backyard, you know. They just, they were just always good friends. And, you know, he started his own business. But that's how it originally got started, was in my granddaddy's backyard. And he made a grill that went over this hole that Chicken and my granddaddy used to barbecue on top of. And he just couldn't hardly wait, you know. They got through that bite. Oh, it was so it good. Was so smell. Smell. And you keep saying, when's it going to be done? Yeah. <laughs> they say, get you two pieces of bread and make a smoked sandwich. Yeah. And they experimented on the sauce and kept cooking and cooking. And they would get it thin. They would do it thick. They would do but it. The main thing with this sauce that people don't understand, you can mix it up all day long, but you have got to let that sauce come to a boil for three minutes and then re-put it back into the gallon jug or in the pork. Yeah, I, I, really, I really couldn't say. I knew something. I know something in Greek. What she tell you could probably be true. Could be true. He dug a hole in the ground, lined up some bricks, laid some mesh wire on top, and built a fire. He sliced up some pork Boston butts and put them on the grill. As they cooked, he basted the meat with a chinaberry stick with a towel tied around the end. The towel got dipped in a mixture of salt water and lemon juice to keep the fire from blazing up and keep the meat moist while it cooked to perfection. My uncle had a farm, and I basically kind of grew up on that farm growing because we used to go up there and help them, you know, harvest the crop. The best thing I can remember about that was my aunt cooking some strictly ham meat early in the morning, and I can remember it like it was yesterday. Man, they almost had to pull me out of the table. I pulled the tablecloth off. The best thing you can smell about 6 o'clock in the morning is some ham meat cooking. It, it, it got to be something to that meat because somebody can be cooking some, some ham, a football field for me. If you go out early in the morning, you'll smell it, and you can go to that house. Mm -hmm. And it's something about anything that got that kind of odor. <laughs> I think Phoenix City has the best barbecue anywhere in the South myself. And that's where he started off just doing a little along until the place got big enough. I can remember the old wood building used to be down there. A little small building, that's where he used to serve at. Like it might have been a storage room, what it really looked like. Yeah, Mr. Snelling owned all, owned, owned all that stuff. You know what I mean? You remember Frank Snelling? The uh, lumber yard on Railroad Street. Our owner, we don't know if he, he paid rent. We don't know how it was. All we know, Chick was there. At that time, you know, there was segregated and stuff, and they right. go back in there, and they would eat. And then there was a door where you go out, and they could go out and call and be everywhere. Right? The house was next to this little uh, wooden villa, and where you see that old tree now standing, she used to stand on the end of her porch and call Chick for everything, because he was very special with her. She didn't work, but they had Anna and Ruby and Della. They had those three children. Of course, we owned the building, and the rent was about $20 a month. Wooden shack with no, no paint on it. 
no pain. I guess grease was a pain of it. So the grease, no tables, so long. Everything was to go. You had to go outside and sit down on the ground, eat it up, take it home with you. And, uh, his brother slept on the floor right there. His name was Henry Coleman. They called him Womp. That's where he slept, on the, on the mattress down on the floor right there. Call called him Womp. Womp used to be drunk, and he'd come through that pass back through this way. He would be so drunk till he'd be crawling, trying to get down there to check. Chick didn't believe in all that, but Chick would see after all of it. He operated in the wooden shack from the late 1930s until the early 1950s, when the wooden shack was about ready to fall down, and the health department was probably on Chick to fix it up or simply build a new place. In about 1951, he built the concrete block building. That's probably it, and said he was going to have to close down, that he couldn't use that building anymore, and we built this one. That was a big improvement over his other building. We built that like a modern building when the wooden building, he just had a big barbecue pit out back and he built that block building and now they screened in the barbecue pit. It was not screened in before. Open pit barbecue outside. You have them over what, uh, what kind of tables in there? I mean, look like old, table. look like old table. picnic tables. Mm -hmm. And uh, no windows in the windows, in the window sills. Which is very good. And I loved it. I go down there a lot of times by myself after I turn.